All righty. Hey, Paul, we are back today with a topic that most people would not see coming next, but you actually raised a couple of really interesting uh, approaches to it and especially grounded it in something Pope Francis said recently. So we're going to talk about chastity, but everybody's getting it maybe not wrong, but a tiny piece of the pie or maybe getting it wrong. Why did you pick chastity for today? Yeah, I've been... Uh... Uh, people have been telling me about chastity since I was, you know, 13, 14 years old. And just a couple of years ago, and when the Pope um, announced the year of St. Joseph, he wrote a document about St. Joseph. Right. And there's a brief passage in there where he talks about chastity. And it, it broke open and presented to me an entirely different way of looking at it that I think undermines um, a lot of toxicity in the church right now, not just in you know, purity culture, chastity culture, but for the wider church as well. So that's why we're talking about chastity today. Yeah. Just the last episode was all about uh, culture warriors. You know, if there is such a thing as a, a Catholic culture, maybe, or a Christian culture versus any other culture and, um, and how we can uh, uh, all too easily obsess over, you know, membership in a particular culture or making it, you know, embodying it and some of the problems we can run into it. So we're not just talking today about the the sexual aspect of chastity, but but more the deeper sense of what chastity is meant to mean as we live it out throughout our entire lives in all our relationships, not just one particular kind. So hello and welcome friends to Pope Francis Generation. It's the show for Catholics struggling with the church's teaching who feel like they might not belong in the church anymore, who still hunger for a God of love and goodness. Your hosts are me, Paul Fahey, a professional catechist. And I'm Dominic, someone who needs catechesis. Together, we're taking our own look at the Catholic Church, her teachings, and her practices from three views that changed our world. And these are the Kerygma, the Doctrine of Theosis, and the teachings of Pope Francis. And if you're not sure what those are, do check episode one. Together with you, we are the Pope Francis generation. So, Paul, let's dig into chastity and... Uh, I think let's start with this quote from the Holy Father in Patris Corde, out of the heart of the Father. I mean, it's the name of your own, your special program, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. This uh, this document, the heart of the Father, um, which is which is very brief. Um, I probably read this thing at least five times in the past year and a half since it came out, wow. and I get something new out of it. Even today, I was looking at parts of it again, and I'm like, oh, this passage, which is different than the one we're going to be talking about. I'm like, this is so good. Um, so it's an, we'll link to it in the show notes. I'll make a mental note to do that. Um, but I think before we start with that passage, Dominic, I want to ask you, um, when you hear the word chastity, like how do you conceptualize it? And I don't know, how was it presented to you for most of your life? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, there was a lot of purity culture, uh, you know, and more of the negative sides of purity culture growing up and chastity was was almost ever only one thing. I think you and I were chatting earlier how it's uh, it's kind of uh, defined as a kind of abstinence, a kind of um, self repression for the greater good, you know. And there there are a lot of very good reasons for good habit forming, you know. And I'm not dissing all of that, but it's um, it became purely a word that was associated with uh, healthy sexual ethics with how to think about as a guy, how to think about girls, girls, how to treat with guys, you know, what, what counts as good dressing, good attitudes. Um, but it was always and ever only about, uh, relationships, sexuality. Um, I'd be told, you know, married couples are still going to be chased. And I would then start scratching my head at that point and be like, you know, and then it would be explained, well, you chase towards other people, you know, and, so in the marriage, you are still, how does that work? And so, and obviously I could sort of go on. I think suffice to say it would always and ever be restricted to topic of uh, sex, sexual identity, uh, drives, you know, um, habit forming, that kind of thing. So basically it, it wasn't, it didn't really have much else of a, of a meaning. Yeah, that's been... That's been my experience. I mean, I remember as a teenager having, I mean, I went, I ended up being at a lot of chastity talks at different youth group events and stuff. And mm -hmm. lots of the speakers would, would start off by saying something like, now, 
a lot of people think chastity just means abstinence, but it means something different. But then the rest of their talk, they'd be talking about uh, abstinence um, or something related to um, modesty or pornography or things like that. Um, mm -hmm. And even when, you know, as I moved in, into young adulthood and got married, the focus of, you know, uh, chastity within marriage was still mostly focused on um, the mechanistics of sexual morality, mm -hmm. um, very like natural law focus, which is very important, um, but it, it didn't really get much to the heart of the matter. Mm -hmm. um, it was still very much, um, like I said, this like, like mechanistic moral law um, yeah. or how you treat other people uh, you mm -hmm. know, who you're not married to things like that. Um, and it was definitely only confined to the area of sexuality and nothing yeah. else. I think I remember occasionally I would come across these really great quotes. And, um, I think maybe it was Chesterton who said something like chastity is not something weak and simpering. Like, I don't remember where he goes, but then he's like, it's, it's like a strong, bold flame for something like Joan of Arc. And I always I remember looking at that thinking, that sounds awesome. I don't totally get it though. Um, and uh, like you pointed out, the the word, you know, you ask somebody what that word means and they can describe it in terms of its subcategories, maybe modesty, and then modesty only as far as dress codes, never modesty of spirit, right? Yeah. Like if you were to ever say, well, being chased in the boardroom, you know, or in the C-suite executive decisions, like what? Or, or being chased up on stage, it's like, wait, what are you doing on stage? No, no, no. There's a uh, this deeper meaning of how we relate to other people, how we respect freedom. And as we go back and look at, for example, the fathers of the church and so on, they're not using the word with the, the very narrow sense that we now read into it today. They are speaking to it out of this much greater, deeper sense Um uh, as it relates to the entire human person. And this is where I'm excited to kind of chat about this today. Um, I don't really, you know, know exactly where we're going to go. And I'm interested to hear, you know, where uh, where you're, you're taking this, how you're grounding this in the Holy Father. Because this sense that I've always struggled with is when it comes to trying to break a habit or, or, or I live a good life or build a good identity, it can never be founded on a no. Uh, it has to be founded on an openness to a yes. And to do that, you have to, paint a picture of what life is going to be like, you know, or create a, a, a vision of who you can be and why that's good for you, as opposed to so much of this chastity discussion is about no, 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 plus no, two fingers and two inches here, no, 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 um, problems. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and the way that Pope Francis frames it is it's a yes, but it's a yes that's oriented towards the good of others. It's it is not um, it is not a personal no. It's not an introspective thing. It's a it's very much rooted in. I mean, it's it's interest. It's self reflective, but it's not um, it's not isolated. Um, chastity mm -hmm. is always about uh, loving the other person and doing what's good right. for the other. It's our orientation, right? Our relationship to others, not just sexually, and it's not about repression. So yeah, let me, I'm not sure where this discussion is going to go either. I've been been chewing on this passage from Pope Francis, like I said, for a year and a half. And I have like scattered ideas that connect to it that I've kind of thrown in our notes. But mm -hmm. my goal is to just kind of uh, walk through this together. And, uh, and again, like we were goes. talking just before we hit record, the key reason why it made sense for this to be the next topic, because we, we just chatted about culture warriors and um, th we... Uh, we often have uh, a, how do I say this? A uh, very strong attachment to what other people do. Maybe how they reflect on us, how they reflect on the tribe, how they reflect on our community, our parish, the church. You know what our children get up to, what our friends and family get up to, um, and we 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 are very attached to that. We're very attached, maybe, to the outcome of a lot of the work that we do, or the the effort, or the relationships that we have. And when you mentioned chastity would be a really great topic to go next, it's like, oh, this makes sense about having a sense of detachment and allowing other people the freedom. And then just, okay, what does that even mean? Because that word has been so co-opted by 
one particular uh, attitude. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. You want to jump in? Fire away. Okay. So, so this is from Pope Francis's apostolic letter on St. Joseph, uh, um, uh, uh, the heart of the father, uh, Patris Corde. Pope says this, being a father entails introducing children to life and reality, not holding them back, being overprotective or possessive, but rather making them capable of deciding for themselves, enjoying freedom, and exploring new possibilities. Perhaps for this reason, Joseph is, is traditionally called a most chaste father. That title is not simply a sign of affection, but the summation of an attitude that is the opposite of possessiveness. Chastity is freedom from possessiveness in every sphere of one's life. Only when love is chaste is it truly love. A possessive love ultimately becomes dangerous. It imprisons, constricts, and makes for misery. God himself loved humanity with a chaste love. He left us free even to go astray and set ourselves against him. The logic of love is always the logic of freedom. And Joseph knew how to love with extraordinary freedom. He never made himself the center of things. He did not think of himself, but focused instead on the lives of Mary and Jesus. What an incredible reflection. So it's a long quote, <laughs> but this, the key to this is Francis is saying, chaste love, chastity mm -hmm. is loving without possessing or controlling the other. Mm -hmm. Or I would go so far as to say, um, being, having one's character so conformed by grace, so made to be like Christ's character, that uh, our disposition is the opposite of possessiveness. We don't even have this desire to possess or control the other. This is chaste love, the Pope says. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In uh, so often, I mean, we we invoke him, we pray to him, Saint Joseph, most chaste, pray for us. And um, it's a, uh, I mean, every time I grew up thinking about that, it was always, you know, his marriage to uh, Mary. But when you look at his actual life, and you begin to get that sense of, um, he wasn't, he was willing to up and go as soon as he got a command, you know. And in a way, this is where uh, taking part of the discussion, I think, from sexual sphere makes a lot of sense because a lot of us when we're when we're dating when we're young heck not even young when we're older when we go to love somebody or we go to you know date or marry uh, a lot of our mind is on you know i want you to love me it's like wow you look amazing i want you to love me right and we spend i think the first half of our lives hopefully if we're making progress in that space it's very much a childish space but we don't realize we're in it and you you have to work through it hopefully really quickly to get to a point where you can, you know, respect and value the, the radical freedom of the other person. Um, even in your, you know, even in your marriage. Um, but you look at St. Joseph's life and he was in this sense, he was chased to his work, chased to his living conditions. You know, I, it, I would have a very hard time being told to climb on a donkey and travel, what would it be, 200 miles to another country, you know, at nighttime. It's, my job is here. My community is here. And in the ancient world, that, that was everything. That was your safety net. That was your security system, was everybody who lived below you and, and above you and, and around. So to get up and leave because of, he had a, you know, it was very clear to him who he needed to be, what his family needed him to be. Um, anything else like on, on the line of his life that ex exemplifies chastity to you? I mean, I, what's interesting, there's, there's a lot of things I like about this passage, but the Pope says that w when we call St. Joseph, the most chaste father, we're talking about, um, the, the summation of his whole attitude, the summation of his character where, okay. So. I think I mentioned this uh, last week as well. Um, there's this passage in the catechism that talks about original sin. And it says that that first sin, uh, in that first sin, um, man and woman let their trust in, in God die. And in response, then they grasp at control themselves. And then the catechism says, this is the form of every sin. 
a doubting of God's goodness, a grasping at control ourself. So this idea of chastity being um, a love that is free from possessiveness, free from a desire to control. Mm -hmm. um, this undermines this undermines sin within relationships. So if you look at the relationships that Joseph had, he didn't need to be the center of attention. He didn't need Mary to like um, fulfill like a fear or something that he had. He was mm -hmm. able to love freely. Mm -hmm. um, so when the Pope says this is the summation of his whole attitude, there's this real sense that Joseph was able to love um, without some agenda behind it. And that allowed him to be the foster father of Jesus without claiming a right to the son of God, but while still being able to pour himself out as a gift um, to care for and protect and nourish the son of God without claiming a title. Mm -hmm. Um I think that especially is where the Pope's the Pope is focusing on this. Yeah. Um, it kind of reminds me of the um, uh, the use. I remember reading once a pious reflection about you know why did Saint Joseph have to die earlier? You know, and um, whoever it was made this was supposed to be like a beautiful point. Like God allowed him to to pass on earlier because there is no way that he would have allowed Christ to go through with passion. He would have done everything possible to rescue him, to stop it because his first mission was the safeguard and, and to protect the Holy family. And so God took him ahead of time because, you know, couldn't have controlled himself. You know, he's, he's such a wonderful guy. And you know, hearing you talk now and thinking, you know what? That's if, BS. <laughs> if he's truly that chaste, I mean, first of all, you're saying he would not have understood Christ's mission that our, you know, Mary got from, from the get go grew into maybe a clarity, um, however we take that, um, he would have understood that he would have been with Mary consoling her up to the end. Yeah. Um, because it, it's just funny how you look at that and realize, whoa, there's a, an assumption of an attachment to the outcome and a misunderstanding of Christ's role, you know? Um, yeah. And I think this attachment to an outcome, <clears throat> this, uh, this agenda behind um, our relationships with others. That's what this is really getting at. Mm -hmm. So even in our sexual relationships, I think this is where thinking about chastity this way, rather than like, um, like sexual ethic mechanics, I think it gets to something deeper where mm -hmm. it's, so even in like, even, even in, uh, married chastity is, is my, is my relationship with my spouse just fulfilling a need that I have? Um, a need to feel loved, a need to feel accepted, a need to feel like undesired. Now, these are very human needs. Like, it's not like these are bad things. Mm -hmm. But am I using my relationship with my spouse to fulfill those needs? Or am I loving my spouse as their own person? Mm -hmm. And without the fear that my needs aren't going to be met. And, right. and I think, and I think that's the key thing behind all of this is like the thing behind doubting God's goodness is fear. Cause once we doubt God's goodness, then we're afraid that we aren't going to be taken care of. So yeah, what else is going to catch us? You know, yeah. If he so, won't. But if we trust God's goodness and we trust God's power, then we have no need to fear. So if we trust that, yes, you know, I may have these needs or these wounds from my childhood or these very legitimate and human things, mm -hmm. but instead of grasping at other people and other relationships to try and fill those needs, mm -hmm. um, if I love others and trust God's goodness and power, right, those needs will still be met, um, but not through my grasping at them, right? Yeah. And I think that's, for me, at least as a married person, that's a much more compelling and a much more challenging mm -hmm. perspective on chastity um, than uh, like anything I've heard from uh, uh, from like a theology of the body apologist or things like that. Yeah. I, I remember um, I'm about 10 years married now. We just had our 10th anniversary and 
think about five or six years in, I remember one day it just became blindingly clear to me that this sense of I'd grown, not necessarily I'd grown up with, maybe I just internalized, I don't necessarily blame other people here, um, that marriage was the, the whole ball and chain thing. I'm stuck in this thing. This is it. You know, We're shackled to each other. Woohoo, that's a good thing. And after about five, six years, I began to realize, no, that's not true. Because the moment that you feel you've lost your freedom as, as a human being, uh, well, then you're not fully responsible. You're not fully free. You're not, you know, we default to all kinds of other responses and reactions to things. But when you're allowed to retain your freedom, uh, you're then free to love because that's the whole point of love. It has to emerge out of a free choice. So to turn around one day and realize, yes, I'm married, but I'm still completely free. The difference is I'm choosing to use my freedom, my waking freedom every day for this person. That, for me, that was a big deal. Yeah. You know? Oh, man. Well, we had said at the beginning that we weren't going to spend this whole time talking about sex. But um, as you were talking, I was reminded of um, uh, some of what I've read from Brené Brown about vulnerability. And in, in one of her books where she's talking about vulnerability, uh, she says that intimacy is not possible without vulnerability. And she says something like, the depth of intimacy that we can have with another person depend on how vulnerable we are with them. Now, the opposite of vulnerability is grasping that control and self-protectiveness, right? Real intimacy with another means being vulnerable with them, letting our defenses down, not needing to grasp at and control situations and relationships and things like that. Um, so th in that sense, for me, when I read her stuff last year, it really opened up um, not marriage as something that constrains my freedom as this ball and chain, but this, this place where I can be vulnerable with another person in a level that I'm not able to be in any other relationship. And in that vulnerability, then have intimacy that I'm not able to have in any other relationship. Yeah. Um, it's at letting go of my defensiveness and my self protectiveness mm -hmm. that I actually have real intimacy. Right. Like there's something deeply human in a positive way about this understanding of chastity. Um, yeah, yeah. Like that was, I was kidding earlier about, you know, chastity in the boardroom or with an audience or with your email list, whatever. Um, I've, one of the things that I've grappled with myself in the last so many years is trying to understand how to run. I'm an entrepreneur, do an online business, that kind of thing. And then to begin to realize I have unintentionally unchaste attitudes towards other people, towards you know their response as if I have a right to demand outcomes, demand response, which doesn't respect or allow other people the freedom, the time, the, the nurturing that they need, you know, and, and you go and you meet, you find these people who are in, in this way, kind of like St. Joseph. As, as a little aside, there's this awesome show called um, Escape to the Chateau, which is, I think, topping the charts in Britain. And it's about two people who head out to uh, France. They decide, instead of spending a million dollars buying a flat in London, we'll spend a million dollars and buy a chateau in France and renovate it, turn it into a wedding uh, reception getaway sort of thing. I, I, I wish I had the uh, the burden of that choice. <laughs> Where am I going to spend my million dollars? <laughs> I, I, anyhow, apparently it's a big thing. British people are heading out to France and refurbishing chateaus, and they've created three shows out of it and stuff. Anyhow, why am I bringing this up? The the husband himself, he's this big, burly, bearded, Santa Claus like guy. If you think of uh, Prince of Egypt, he's kind of like the father of that tribe who sings the song, learn to join the dance. He's that kind of guy who's a phenomenal chef. His two beautiful little children, his wife, he remarried. She's like, I think 20 years younger than him. So she's quite young. She's extremely creative. I love to think of St. Joseph as someone like him. He, um, I think Britain was like trying to vote on who are the two most popular people on television. And the vote came down to between this couple because they're so fun to watch. She's so creative. He's so gregarious. He's so loving to his children. He's so present, so attentive to his wife. 
he's crafty. He's good with his hands. He's chopping wood. He's he's gutting towers and you know putting in elevators and this, the guy is just incredible i look at him and i get man envy you know or like i turn in my masculinity card you know saint joseph is someone like that you know when i like to think of someone full of life and just has this phenomenal chastity towards his life and understanding the the, the gift of his presence to others and what what that you know needs to mean taking that into again all the areas of our life, allowing other people to be free, allowing their decisions to be free. Um, it's something I'm still trying to wrap my head around because we don't really see it modeled, you know, very much. And this is kind of where I want to go next is uh, along the lines of like, um, what is it? Like a mental health space. I see a lot of unchaste attitudes towards other people, not just sexually, but in any relationship can also emerge out of a lot of pain. Uh, childhood abandonment, trauma, uh, wounds from parents, you know, and we react in that way of from a space of fear and unsafety because we can't imagine a way to be safe and to be ourselves unless other people act in predictable uh, ways or ways we can count on, ways we can demand. And when that doesn't happen, we lose our inner peace. We lose our minds. We decenter, flail, panic, prey, you know, yeah. Um, maybe later we can talk about being chased towards God himself because that kind of intrigues me. I think it's very much out of our own woundedness and insecurities that it's from those places that we try and grasp at other people and grasp at relationships uh, to, to meet those needs. What's interesting, um, one thing that really stood out to me about this passage from the Pope is that now whenever i hear the title uh, joseph most chaste i i've always heard most chaste spouse francis uses the title most chaste father and in this whole passage there was nothing about his married relationship nothing about sexuality whatsoever it was about uh his relationship with jesus as jesus's father Francis is taking the virtue of chastity and putting it in a parental relationship context. Like what he's, or at least what I took from it is as a parent um, of four kids, what are my fears about my kids? And, and where do I try to possess and control my kids? Like where do I not respect their freedom? Where, where am I like trying to use my relationship with them to meet my own needs and insecurities? Yeah. These are not easy. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, these are questions that keep parents up at night. <laughs> these are not easy questions. Um, but I think that it's those questions in that relationship that are important. In my own ministry, I've worked with a lot of, a lot of people um, who have adult children, um, adult children who've, who've left the faith. And there's this profound fear um, in that. And that fear motivates a grasping at control or an anxiety or, um, a, again, this attitude of possessiveness instead of a... Um, a freedom to love and to respect my child's freedom. But you can only have that if you trust in God's goodness. You can only have that if you can trust that God's that God loves your kid more than you love your kid, that God's pursuing your, your kid and watching out for your kid m more than you can. Um, so yeah. like this trusting in God's goodness comes first. Um, but yeah, like the Pope really focuses this discussion of chastity onto how do parents treat their kids? And I mean, I think, I, I think this, this, these questions can play out in a million different ways in those types of relations. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I like his line where he says a possessive love ultimately becomes dangerous. It imprisons, constricts and makes for misery. And, um, it, and if you're an adult and you have parents like, yeah. 
at least a lot of my own peers, we've experienced that to some extent with our own parents, even if our parents are great, right? There's this the tension in, you know, like your 20s and 30s as you're trying to figure out how to be an adult child, you know, and your parents are figuring out how to be a, a parent to an adult child. Um, and you kind of like find the limits of where possessiveness creates relationships of constraint and misery and communicating and navigating those things. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, um, I think there's some phenomenal parents out there and, and they're the ones who, when they go on to model that encouragement of freedom and not the, the more narcissistic desire to live their children's lives for them, there's that space of unchastity, not actually seeing the children uh, as their own individuals with their own lives, their own charisms, their own need to be encouraged in their own freedom. And I think we don't, we just don't see it. You know, a, a um, wonderful book is uh, The Great Divorce yeah. by C.S. Lewis. And I kind of wish it had a different name now because it was written as a response to, what was it? The Marriage of Heaven and Hell. And, um, but it's got this phenomenal series of vignettes of people who are, in fact, actually, if I remember them all, they're all incredibly unchaste towards their attachments to things. One's one person's attachment to this little demonic lizard. One, the mother's attachment towards the role that she plays in her family and her inability to let that go. And, and the whole point of the series of vignettes was like, these are all the people who don't make it into heaven because they don't want it, and they're so happy with where they are, they're unwilling to do to, to grow. I'm not sure they're happy, happy where they are, but um, they're unable to let go of, of that. And I think that that's, I mean, there's very much this narcissistic, like, I need to like live vicariously through my children. But even in my own heart, as I've thought about this, um, chase love means respecting other people's freedom, even when their free choices are harming them. Right, the Pope says, um, God Himself loved humanity with a chaste love because He let us, because He left us free even to go astray and set ourselves against Him. Chaste love even means mm -hmm. letting someone else make mistakes that harm them. Mm -hmm. So maybe even more difficult or deeper than this narcissistic, I need to live through my kids is this. I don't want my kids to get hurt mm -hmm. and I'm willing to violate their freedom in order to prevent them from getting hurt. I, th I think that's where I very much disagree with that uh, image of image of St. Joseph. You were talking about that. He had to die mm -hmm. before the passion. I'm like, no, no, no. He would have, like you said, he would have understood Jesus's mission mm -hmm. and he would have respected Jesus's choice to participate in that as Mary did. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but we can expand this out and we can talk about, so what does chastity look like in our relationships with our friends? Are my friends like fulfilling needs, like personal needs that I have, or am I loving them as they are and respecting their, those choices? Or for, or for me, like, especially, you know, in the past 10 years, um, going through, uh, my twenties, I had lots of friends who like we had initially bonded, you know, college age uh, or around that time over our, over our Catholicism and who have since left the church mm -hmm. and then how that's impacted my relationship and how, like looking back, how I realized like a condition on our friendship was like their Catholicism. Um, so was I really loving them with a chaste love? Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. And then as you've been talking about what does chase love look like in our business relationships with business partners, but even in our relationships with, um, you know, the stores that we buy products from, um, this idea of not using the other person. Um, yeah. I mean, how many telemarketer calls do we get? I mean, that is not a chaste conversation No, <laughs> where as soon as you know 
you you maintain your boundary too strong, they're they're gone, or they they do not let go because they got to make a quota, whatever. Or like the, you walk into a store, and as soon as the person senses they're not actually going to sell you something, just drop. I could not believe this one day. My wife and I went to buy a mattress, and this guy was like grandpa all over us, walking up and kind of interest you in this and so on. And as soon as you know, we looked at a couple and then we said, well, we're just shopping because we just need to know what the price ranges are. This is supposed to be like a, you know, half off mattress sale, which they all are all the time somehow. <laughs> as soon as I said that, boom, he would not even make eye contact. He went back and sat at his desk. We walked out and thinking, oh, he's, he's a nice guy. He'll, you know, we waved, say goodbye, pointedly not looking like, my gosh, how do you build business relationships that way? His identity was way too invested in what he was trying to do with his business. Uh, and, and for those of us who are entrepreneurs, maybe, or if you're on LinkedIn, for example, the number of people who will send you business requests or, you know, and then as soon as they notice, oh, I'm not getting anything out of this. Well, I'm not here for you as a person. Um, so, you know, we're done. Now I recognize you, you have to manage your time and not everybody's for you and so on, but there's this unchaste business culture as well. Um, of a lack of concern for the, the freedom, uh, the timing of another person's journey. Yeah. I also think this attitude, this culture is very present within the church as well. I, I think it's more, more subtly present in the types of relationships that, that, that we've already talked about, right? Um, where your adult child leaves the faith or your friend leaves the faith. I, where some someone's religious practice um is a contingent part of your relationship with them um and i think that's very present i think it's present present also in so i led rcia for many years at my parish and um you know i get a lot of uh i get a lot of people who had been going to other Protestant churches, you know, and there was a couple different people and they were two or three years apart who had gone to a, um, uh, the same church, actually. I don't think they knew each other, but it was the, the same church in, in, you know, a neighboring town. And they both described that community as if you aren't checking all the boxes, they would shun you. They would, you know, if, as long as you were checking all the boxes, show up at your house, make your meals, mm -hmm. you know, your husband's sick or you just had a baby, they'll, you know, all, they'll help you out. But if you're not checking one of the boxes, you're not a part of the community at all, right? Um, their caring for you was contingent upon you doing all the right religious practices. Mm -hmm. Um I mean, I've experienced this in a small um, Catholic uh, community I was a part of uh, for several years where uh, the local leaders in that community, like they would give um, voice to, you know, everything's a free choice. Everything's a free choice. But when you step back and thought about it, you're like, OK, but if I don't do what they're asking, there's actual consequences to that. I'm going to be called out and shamed and, and shamed in front of everybody, right? Um, or things like that, where there was this facade of respecting everyone's freedom. Mm -hmm. But in reality, there's <clears throat> social consequences. Um, right. And I think yeah. this happens all over the place. Well, I'd like to dig a little more into that. Like, what is, how should we understand freedom? Um, so, because that is also, I think, an incredibly important part of this discussion. You know, how we articulate that, how we understand that like in America, first world West, has a particular meaning, how it's meant to be understood or respected within uh, the Catholic space or, or just within the Christian space or the human, in, in the space of human dignity. Uh, before diving into that, we do want to thank our sponsor, Select to Give. Um, more Catholic leaders choose Select International Tours. Uh, more than any other pilgrimage company with 35 years of award-winning travel planning, they have a track record of excellence and faithfulness. They're a small company with a big heart because every one of their pilgrimage trips helps to support and fund their 501c3 charity work, helping Christian families thrive in the Holy Land. 
So if you're ready to travel, or if you're looking to lead a group of your own, take the next step on your pilgrimage by visiting selectinternationaltours.com. So this is a bit of a sidebar from the outline you put together, but I think it's a good one. How should we understand freedom? Because um, I remember one teacher in, in uh, was, was Christendom College, I went for one year, and I remember his ringed hand, and he would talk about maximal human freedom. And I thought, wow, yeah, maximal freedom. Okay. I can't, you know, but then I would run around not actually respecting everybody else's maximal human freedom, you know, and I would, I would dislike them and judge them. And like, oh, you're not really part of, I don't know, the label I was attributing to myself. How should we understand freedom such that somebody else can follow their conscience? Like we spend an episode talking about that. Um, how would you define freedom or should yeah. it be defined? Yeah. So, uh, I'll just go to the catechism. Uh, it, it defines freedom as uh, the power rooted in reason and will to act or not to act, to do this or to do that, and so to perform deliberate actions on one's own responsibility. By free will, one shapes one's own life. Human freedom is, the, is a force for growth and maturity and truth and goodness. It attains its perfection when directed toward God. So it's choice is freedom. Mm -hmm. um i think what's different from a christian context a christian understanding of freedom from a secular understanding of freedom or you know a very like american understanding of freedom mm -hmm. is we don't see um freedom is having more and more capacity to choose what's good more and more capacity to love um, and I think this ties very well in with this idea of theosis, this idea of Christification. Growing in holiness is allowing grace to transform us to be more like Christ. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why we look to the martyrs as people who are truly free. Because they are free to let go of everything to do what's good. Um, and I think when we think about our own freedom, or when I think about my own freedom, I think about what constricts my freedom. And it's almost always fear. Fear of what others are going to think. Fear of, you know, any pain or suffering or inconvenience this may cause me. Things like that. That's what mm -hmm. constricts my freedom. So there's this Christian sense where freedom is the capacity to choose the good. But in order to choose the good, we also have to have the freedom to choose the what's not good, mm -hmm. um, to miss the mark. As, yeah, uh, Saint Paul says it. Yeah. Um, so you know, if we think of like a society or or a, or a culture, mm -hmm. um, society, laws, politics, culture, these things, when they're good, um, make it easier for people to choose what's good. Mm -hmm. and discourage people from from choosing what's bad um that's when laws and society are doing well mm -hmm. um freedom for freedom's sake allowing people or like encouraging people to choose whatever they want isn't necessarily a healthy understanding of freedom mm -hmm. yeah the, the i'm not a philosopher and i've not taken way enough philosophy classes, hence the structure of that sentence right there. But modern freedom is articulated, as I understand it, as the um, uh, the ability to, to uh, well, define my own destination, uh, define my own purpose, and so on. As opposed to the way freedom is, is um, lived out within Christian community or Christian culture. Um, and when you just mentioned you were part of a community, it made me think about uh, people who choose to walk away from the faith, um, or people who disagree with certain things, and and the automatic response from pretty much everyone else is, "Well, if you do that, uh, you're going to hell." Yeah, and that really raises the question, and I think a ton of frustration with people. Well, how free am I? Like, what is my freedom? If I think this is true, I can't do anything but follow it. Um, I love this one quote from Nietzsche, I think, who said, uh, Jordan Peterson quotes it a bunch, and he's like, um, uh, there's a difference between 
uh, what is it, like virtuous people and, and weak people. And uh, most uh, Christians or most people who think themselves virtuous are just merely weak. They just lack the capacity to do anything meaningful or strong. And that is not a virtue. That's not a good thing. Um, and people who stay because it it's a habit, uh, people are going to look down on me, but secretly I want to leave, you know, or I don't even think I should be here. I have more respect for people uh, who get up and go because they not just think it's true, but they believe it's true, you know. Yeah. But then the rest of us can't accept that. And in that sense, we are unchaste to what they, where they need to go, you know, as much as we dislike it. So I'm curious if what your response to to that would be. <laughs> This is a whole can of worms. Um, we should have a topic sometime uh, talking about uh, spiritual abuse. Um, in s some of his writing, Pope Francis has talked about abuse of people's consciences. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot that that means. But I think one of, the th one of the things it means is telling people, if you don't do this, you're damned. If you don't belong to this community, you're going to hell. Um, I think that is extremely manipulative and it undermines, um, belief in an all good and an all powerful God mm -hmm. who r relentlessly loves each one of us. I really think that, um, if someone leaves the church, because they've been wounded by the church, um, because the love of Jesus Christ has never been presented to them in the church, or a whole host of other reasons. And they're sincerely seeking what's true and what's good. Like, it's sad that they've left the church, but it's really the responsibility of the community who failed to care for them, failed to protect them, failed to provide the love of God to them. Um, that I I trust that the Lord is good and the Lord is powerful and he will write this person's life straight, no matter all, all the twists and turns this person's life may take, um, that the Lord has those things in his control. Which is really difficult when you care for this person tremendously and you believe what you believe, what we believe as Catholics about the church and about the sacraments, to watch someone walk away. It's extremely difficult, but that's where like we're called to surrender to God's power and and God's goodness as well. Um, but it's highly manipulative. I mean, and extremely inappropriate. I mean, it's just it's such a violation of someone's person and someone's freedom to try to control them and their life by threatening uh, hell. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, th I think we've got this on the slate for later on uh, to talk about hell. Um, but is there any way in which hell can be a, a threat or it can be weaponized or used? You know? That's a good question. Um, because it's like the ultimate um, shackle on somebody's freedom, you know, to... My gut right now, and I may change my mind next week. <laughs> I think it may be inappropriate to ever use hell as a threat for somebody else. Um, Jesus talks about hell. I mean, I think about the parable of Lazarus and the rich man, right? Mm -hmm. But I think Jesus told that. And the way that he talks about hell is for us to have self-reflection, not for us to use or wield against other people. Um, and I think, and I think having mm, a vulnerability, a transparency with ourselves and with the Lord about our own capacity, mm -hmm. um, to do evil things, to gravely harm others, to reject what's good and what's true, to turn our backs on the Lord. I think that's a very good thing. And I think that's what Jesus prompts us to. But to wield hell as a way to control other people's behavior, 
I think that's highly manipulative and inappropriate. Yeah. But yeah, you know, we, we should talk about hell. That's on our list, but you know, we haven't, yeah, we don't need to get into it too much. <laughs> haven't really been, but it is part of this whole freedom. And, and, um, and I, I think this does come back to that sense of, um, do you say our attachment to the outcome, you know, our attachment to people's reaction, our attachment to how people live, how, how our children, uh, are growing up to be how they're reflections of us, how they respect what we think, uh, members of our parish, um, people we dislike, you know, and uh, it's it really is a call every time that we we experience the the rejection, the resistance, um, the dislike, to take a step back and wonder why am I actually feeling this? You know, maybe it's just a habit that I learned when I was a little kid. I don't like people who do this or this, whether it was good or not. And I just never stop to rethink that or reintegrate that or, you know, do the shadow work as the therapists would say. Um, and, and try to actually make a free decision in the moment because I am doing this constantly, but dialing my reactions. And the point about that is you, you're, the call is going on before you even realize it's happening. Uh, it's not even speed dialing. It's like, it's, oh, I didn't know that was on. It's like, I didn't know that habit was firing off. That reaction was... And um, I think the moment that we start to demand other people fit our molds, fit our expectations of this is what counts as good, and we all do that because we all have to create an internal model, an internal destination of this is what it means to be good and I'm on that path and I can't really understand somebody else not actually getting that. And I mean, that's a whole massive discussion, yeah. uh, I think, in that sense. So, yeah, I've come to realize in doing some of uh, that self-reflection where when I've realized that, you know, whatever, certain people's behavior, like certain behaviors, like, like really bother me and really make it difficult for me to be in relationship with someone who had particular behaviors, whatever. I was praying with that one day and the thing that came to mind was, um, uh, I'm, I'm elevating these particular behaviors, these, these particular sins, um, as worse than any other. Um, and I'm, and I'm upset by these person's sins more than my own. Uh, and often they're the sins that I don't struggle with. And mm -hmm. I, once I can once I came to realize that, um, yeah, that's self-criticism in a positive way was, mm -hmm was easier. Um, I wanted to end though, before uh, we leave. Um, so I've been, uh, I'm just over a year into a, um, into a master's in counseling program for, um, mental health and pastoral counseling. And this teaching from Pope Francis has lined up, um, with a lot of what I've learned in that program. Um, which is pretty much a secular program. It's it's not a religious program at all. Um, one of the things that we've been talking about is uh, Carl Rogers. So um, he's a psychologist um, from from the 1900s, and he came up with uh, the person centered theory of counseling. And what he proposed is that uh, being with another person who is genuine, who listens to you, who values you who empathizes with you and who shows you unconditional positive regard. And I'll explain what that means. But being in that relationship is itself healing. Absolutely. Being in, he called these the therapeutic core conditions, that someone being in that environment is actually healing. And you could see that in, you know, in changes in people's behavior and stuff, but there's even been research done on a neuro, on a neuro, <laughs> on a neuro neurological level, I, mean, I, got, I got that out. There's actual healing that happens there. Um, so what does that mean, right? That means, so like, like empathy is hearing someone else's perspective and experience and letting it be their experience without feeling like you need to correct it. Mm -hmm. It means not judging them. It means recognizing their emotions and communicating that you recognize their emotions without feeling like you need to fix or control their emotions, 
letting their emotions be their emotions in that moment and being with them in those emotions. And then unconditional positive regard means seeing someone as inherently good and lovable, no matter what their behaviors are. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't mean you have to accept their behaviors, but it means you accept who they are as a person, regardless of their behaviors, that they are good and lovable people. Um, I think this like illustrates what the Pope's talking about in a tremendous way. This is what it's like to be in relationship with someone and to love them chastely. This is what it means to, res to respect their freedom and their experience. It doesn't mean having to agree with all of their choices, but it does mean loving them and valuing them and respecting their freedom. And I think a great word here is um, uh, objectifying. Um, what is what it does it? How would you describe what it means then to objectify uh, a person? Um, how about how about I answer that by giving the opposite example? Um, the way you just you have given that okay, you've modeled that behavior, you know. <clears throat> with uh, what you've just described from Carl Rogers. Uh, I think where I'm going with this is every time that we, um, when we do this sexually, you know, with uh, pornography, with, you know, we're reducing, even in our dating lives, I'm, I cringe at the amount of times I did this and I thought I was in a great relationship and I wasn't, I was a needy so-and-so and I was objectifying this other person as a panacea for my feeling good -nessification. When we do that to, uh, to our children, to the people that we work with. We reduce them as objects to satisfy what we need to acquire yep. in life. Yep. Progress, get ahead, feel better, do things. That is, that's what is unchaste. But yeah. coming back to what you just outlined, that is that, that chaste approach of allowing them to be themselves, to validate them, to create that space of empathy as you described. Yeah, and I think more subtly, this unchastity comes out whenever we actually, you know, articulate this out louder in our mind, or whether it's just in our hearts, and we haven't examined it yet, where I can love this person, except for I can love this person, or, or this person is good, but right, or if this person did this, then I could love them or care for them. And I think a lot of times those those ifs or those buts, go unexamined. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the self reflection that that the Pope's really calling us to is what types of conditions are we putting on um, the relationships that we have with the people that we care about. It's beautiful. I think yeah. That's a great place to wrap. So um, thank you to your listeners. You know, I want to put a plug in here for smart Catholics because that's we're collaborating with Paul on doing this. But Honestly, having listening to Paul kind of walk through these these key points, um, you know, allowing someone's experience to be their experience, not judging, uh, recognizing their emotion, you know, without trying to fix them, all of these things are hallmarks of the kind of community that we're trying to build in Smart Catholics from day one. Now you come and join, and you decide if you know how we're matching up to that, but I guarantee. 90% all of the, the people who, who are showing up regularly are people who believe this, you know, and believe that this is true and that this is good. And I'm, I'm honored and privileged to uh, have them come together and to create this space. So if this sounds like you, uh, if you enjoyed this conversation, please do hit that like button. Please do subscribe so that more people can, uh, can learn about this kind of conversation, learn about our work with smart Catholics, learn about Paul's work, uh, smart Catholics. It's a free Catholic community, free of trolls and ads and toxicity, faithful to the Holy father, Pope Francis and the church committed to a culture of kindness and learning. If that sounds like you come and check us out at smartcatholics.com. Uh, maybe share this interview with, um, interview conversation <laughs> with, uh, one person that you think would actually benefit or, you know, feel validated or heard buy it and you've probably got questions maybe something was articulated the way that is normal to you or maybe you've got a question where can people uh send us questions paul yeah you can contact us at uh pope um and that's where 
uh, I share all the podcasts. It's also where I share uh, my own writing um, that, that I continue to grow. And um, I link to the writing that I do at where Peter is in other places as well. Um, it's also the place where you can support me. Um, my wife and I were, you know, raising a family and putting myself through, through grad school. Um, and part of our income is, uh, is the support that we get through this podcast and, and through my newsletter. So yeah, check out the newsletter at PopeFrancisGeneration.com. So there you go. So till next time, please say a short prayer for us and for yourself. And remember, don't be afraid to ask questions. Doubts can be a sign that we want to know God better and more deeply. God bless you.